he already in Mexico know that the drug cartels got better and they are attacking police, they're attacking military, and they're killing people with the enemy. The first attack, generally we fight off each time that we in our authority, there are more attacks that come and they become more and more enemies kingdom is very tightly organized very weak beings beings but he's limited so he doesn't attack people with the officers or soldiers in his army if he doesn't need to so be aware that you fought off them off but they can get stronger and it needs more for us to continue to do that and again back to obedience though James says obey your ground until the devil to leave and he must but the first part of that is obedience it only works when truly 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 we're being obedient Savior is holy, and only when we guard it as holy does it have power. The people that use his name for an exclamation of disgust or whatever else trivialize the name. And so when they use his name, there is no power in that name because they have failed to keep our Lord and Savior's name holy. But we who keep his name holy see a difference when we say that name. And I'm not saying it lightly as an illustration on purpose because the name is the name above all names. It is the most powerful weapon that we have. And when we say our Lord and Savior's name, we ought to mean it and it ought to be at a time when it is appropriate because he is holy and every time we speak his name it should be because it is a holy name and when we pray and we pray in his name we are praying because we want his as it is in heaven so the first is one of the most important pieces of things there was in ecclesiastics we hear this time and time again so if we go all the way back to the garden of eden when eve is tempted the pattern doesn't change there is a questioning of what we really heard of what was really told to us by god and in eve's case it was told to her by directly from God. Most of our information that we get, we get out of books or TV or we hear somebody saying something. I am told there is a city called Timbuktu on the northern bank of Western Africa. I believe it because I've seen pictures, I've seen maps. There is enough evidence for me to believe that, but I've never been there, so I'm taking it on faith. Most of the information that we have, we take on faith. And that's what makes it so important for us to analyze where are we getting this information. Obviously, if we're getting 100% right, 100% we find that the accuser's talking to us, we know it's trash. 100% bad. But if you notice throughout scripture, when we find the accuser talking, he knows God's word and he misquotes. I'm saying God's word. But just because somebody is saying God's word, you still have to test it to make sure that it is in fact being used correctly. Because without that, we got one Pentecostal here. That's good. Amen. All right. 
That's what we're supposed to do. The Bereans in the Near East, when Paul was teaching, didn't just accept what he had to say. They went back to the Word and looked at it. Is this aligned with the Word of God? And, and obey. Taking care of that is really, really important. The, one of the things that we do is most of our information comes from human beings. And we're all flawed. We have good intentions, sometimes we have bad intentions, but even with good intentions, we can say the wrong thing. I had my cardiologist tell me that I need to lose weight, and I have people look at me and say, oh, you don't need to lose weight, and I gently explain to them, I appreciate you saying that, I but the cardiologist is basing this on a huge background of information and a vast amount of experience, not just his, but all of the medical people, his peers, both in the present and in the past. And I need to listen to the person better information. Oh, you look fine. We all want to hear that. <laughs> But at the same time, we don't want to act on that information if it's not completely true. So, talking about appearance, I want to uh, mention to you about, again, lies. Joshua, in chapter 9, we have a very odd situation in chapter 9. Joshua is talking to the Lord. The Lord has promised to be with Joshua as he was with Moses. They have been told to kill everybody in the land of Canaan. This is the promised land. All of these people need to be removed because they, they are so far into sin there is no way for them to get back out of it. And then the Gibeonites are listening to this. They're, they're in Canaan. They hear what the Israelites are doing, so what do they do? They fake this situation where they load all this stuff onto their, their horses and burrows to make it look extremely old, like they've been traveling for a month or five weeks. And their clothes are filthy. And they get there and they tell the Israelites, oh, we've come from a long way off. We want to make a peace treaty with you. Now, the first problem here is, if they're from the land of Canaan, doesn't matter how far they traveled, there is no peace treaty to be made. And the Israelites just ask, a distant country. Well, it still doesn't matter where it is. Because if it's in the land of Canaan, you're going to die. The second thing they didn't do was they didn't pray. They didn't ask God, okay, what should we do for somebody coming up and saying they want to make peace with us? So what are we supposed to do? No, they acted on their own. Lies will do that to us. There are them because maybe it's a doctor telling us that something's going on, but it's like a curse that the doctor gives a diagnosis because he's try he or she is trying to be helpful, but that's weighing down because this is not this onto us. Is the doctor of doctors? We have the privilege of consulting with the doctor of doctors. It doesn't matter what the the human doctor says we have a higher authority that we can appeal to and that we can get blessing. Too often I hear people say, it's my disease, it's my pain. And I always gently try and correct them and say, you have pain, you have a diagnosis of a disease, but it is most certainly not yours. Because the more we identify with this thing, the worse it gets and the harder it is to pull it out. I think I've told you uh, the story, but I'm going to repeat it because I think it's very important. And the teacher was talking about a, a fellow that had gotten a scholarship 
to play tennis in college. And just before he was to go, he was in the shower, he slipped and fell, and he injured his arm, the elbow in his arm. And he got prayer, and he got prayer, and he got prayer. And he finally got to uh, this man, and uh, the man's name is Dan, and he asked him, well, What exactly did you say? Well, it turns out the fella had cursed himself. You know, so many times, oh, you stupid, whatever. Well, you say that to yourself. Somebody else gave you a curse. So what Dan had to do was get him to renounce the words that he spoke. Now, the guy didn't believe him and did it in a little sing-song monotone, you know, like the little kid that's forced to recite something that I spoke against myself. And then, boom, he got healed. All the virtue of healing was there, but because he believed a lie, he had blocked the blessing from arriving to him. So be careful what you hear yourself say because again in James our tongue should be for blessing not for cursing and be aware that we can curse ourselves just as other people get cursed. These Gibeonites showing up we need to be more careful about who we talk to and who we trust because these people have come and, okay, why have you come? How have you heard of us where you have to, you know, you, you just think through this. How could they have heard of this in such a far distant country? And why would you be coming all this distance to talk to us? Just the story just doesn't sound right. But sometimes the lies are better. Have you been there where you've had people tell you stuff? And then you find out you get another source or another piece of information, all of a sudden you realize, oh, this is not right. And you pull that thread and that story just unravels completely. So along with the lies that people come and do that, there are people that claim to be our friends. And I've purposely chosen First Samuel chapter 27 to illustrate this because this is David with a Philistine king. As uh, Pastor has said, David didn't wait for God's blessing. He fled Israel and went to Felicia. He went to the king of Gath where he had killed their hero Goliath, but there he was and the king of Gath and he basis he went out and killed Philistines every day came back and lied he was a false friend sometimes we think it's okay that David did this past because of these lies because of the killing of innocent people he believes this had a bad effect on David later it's very rare lie and, and really have it justified in God's eyes. This is not an occasion, even when you're killing your sworn enemies, he was killing children who had nothing to do with any of it. They were young enough that had they taken them, they could have raised them up with the fear of the Lord, and they would have been fine. But be aware that there are false friends. Those of us... We can't control our coworkers, and I know Sister Cheryl is going to say amen because she's got some real, uh, real pills there. And we have to deal with these people, and some of them try and ingratiate themselves with us, but they are not our friends, and they will never be our friends, and they're looking to upset us. I had a coworker that it seemed to irritate her that I was generally calm. And so she set about trying to find ways to irritate me. And she actually was pretty good at it. 
but thank God she retired, so I'm free. <laughs> But it's something that we deal with when we go to work. We don't have this control over them. We only have control over ourselves. One of the best basketball coaches in history, John Wooden of UCLA, back in the days where UCLA was 11 times out of 12, his best quote was, we cannot control others, but we can control ourselves. So he applied that principle to his basketball team. And I remember, because I'm from this area, they were playing Cal Berkeley. Cal Berkeley was up two points with three seconds to go. Guess who won? UCLA, yeah. Because UCLA kept control of themselves. The Cal players were so nervous about having a lead on the great giant UCLA they fumbled it away. We don't want to be the team that's doing an upset and blow it. As long as we stay with God, in. But again, no weapon formed against us will prosper indicates we are going to have struggles, we are going to have battles, we are going to have people in our lives causing problems or trying to cause problems for us. And then the, the final piece of this is when we leave God's protection, when we voluntarily leave of our own accord because somebody has got us confused enough to think it's a good idea. In Numbers chapter 25, this is coming right after Balaam was contracted by the uh, Amalek king to curse Israel. And he told him, I can't curse Israel, I can't do this. But the money that was available, Balaam decided he'd go and try. You know, who knows, maybe God will give me a little window and I can curse these people. This is the famous story of when he starts out that his donkey talks to him. And the man is so fixed on that money, he's beating his donkey and talking to the donkey like this is an everyday occurrence. You know somebody is pretty distracted when a donkey talks to you and you act like, yeah, this happens all the time. I think most of us would have been looking at the donkey going, when did you learn how to talk? But so he gets there, in the course of three days, he blesses Israel three times and curses Amalek one time. But again, the story doesn't stop there. He comes up with this great plan. I can't curse the Israelites. I can't touch them. But I can foul them up so they come from under God's protection out to where God himself will give them trouble. So what's he do? In this particular case in chapter 25 of Numbers, he has the Moabite women seduce the Isra uh, Israelite men and because of this sexual sin 24,000 people die. They voluntarily left the shade of the mighty right hand of God and went out into the sun and died from pestilence. We don't want to be like that either. We want to keep under the protection of God. There's a lot of temptations I'm mentioning here sexual temptation, and in this society at this time, there is, we are super saturated with sexual images, uh, barely clad women, suggestive poses, all sorts of trash on TV that's beaming right into our homes, and things that you wouldn't expect to happen on programs. I saw a scene on a, on a show I flipped over, oh, what's this? And I saw a scene there, I was like, what? And it had, it was TV 14. I wouldn't want my 38-year-old son watching that scene, but they had TV 14. So this is a constant problem. Every billboard we see, magazine covers, you go on the internet and you're looking through a serious news site and they still have this junk on. But money is another problem possessions, authority, power, 
there are many things that can pull us out from under the protection of God and ruin us. So we want to be careful with that. Because without God's protection, life's pretty tough. I, you know, it's here, life under the sun, it's already kind of difficult as it is. But you do it without God, and it's really tough. So, there's, there's just three things that I want to close with. The, and again, it goes back, listen to God trust God, and obey God. And when I say listen to God, not just the word, but make sure that what's being told to you aligns with it, that your actions when nobody sees you aligns with the word of God, or your actions when everybody's looking at you align with the word of God. Trust him. Don't try and help him out. Don't try and say, well, gee, God didn't get it quite right. I'll just Help him out. That never works. It never, never works. And of course, obey God. Like we talked about last week. If God asks you for a cup of water, he wants water. Because you don't know what he wants the water for. Cola into wine than it is water. Because water is part of the process going through the grapes into wine. Coca-Cola used to have the coca leaf from which they refine cocaine in. So we don't really want to be giving people Coca-Cola when God asks for water. You see what I mean? It just so quick when we try and help out God. And as Proverbs says, choose your friends wisely. These are people that you're going to spend time with. These are people that whose opinions become valuable to you and can influence you. You probably all heard the story about the guy that smokes. He only smokes when he goes to the bar to watch the game and when he's with the people looking at the game, he starts to drink and when he drinks, he wants to smoke. You can see all this long sequence of events that gets him into this. Well, don't go to the bar. But people think this, wow, that's, I, oh, I, you know, I, I need to, no, 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 no. Change the way you do things. Choose your friends wisely. Weigh what people say. The uh, author of The Lord of the Rings had a uh, wonderful line in uh, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, one of the characters says it, and what he says is, all gold does not glitter, and all that glitters is not gold. And this is true in our lives. There are things that look fantastic, but they're not. And there's things that look rather ordinary and unassuming, and they're really spectacular. So we need to weigh what's being said and check it. And of course, finally, compare everything with God's Word. Because... Even if an angel comes down from heaven and starts preaching something other than the gospel, we're not to believe him. And remember, our accuser still has the vestiges of authority that were given to him by God, and he can assume to our human eyes to be an angel of light. He can pretend to still be an angel of light, even though he is no longer an angel of light. It is only through God that we can discern this is evil. And then, finally, finally, be vigilant. And like Pastor likes to do, be vigilant, be vigilant, be vigilant. We always want to be vigilant because ambushes don't happen if we're vigilant because we can see things coming up through the discernment of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to... The Holy Spirit has seen everything, much more than our accuser has. So all of these things we know, it's like Pastor was talking about, if you have a problem with what you're looking on in the internet, don't go on the internet when nobody else is in the room. Always have a monitor there with you so that somebody is looking at what you're looking at. Or 
take the internet out of your home because most of the time you don't need it anyway. All it's doing is eating up your time. I use that just as an example. So be vigilant. Amen. Amen. Been awfully quiet this morning. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I'd like you to stand up. I'd like to pray for us all because we all need to be vigilant. We all need to listen to God, to trust God, to obey God. We need to be very careful with who we let into our lives and what we listen to. Lord, Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for this meeting this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word that helps us, like a plumb line, decide what is right, what is upright, what is just, what is holy, separating it out from what we shouldn't do, what is bad for us. Help us, Lord, increase your kingdom. Help us each day die to sin and live for your kingdom, that each day more and more of Christ will live in us and less and less of us will live. In Fill us with your mercy, fill us with your love, fill us with your boldness, fill us with your courage, fill us with your strength, fill us with your wisdom, that we may be truly a light on a hill shining in the darkness and be a blessing to many. We thank you, Lord, and we give you all honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much. And come back next week. Pastor will be back full of blessing. He might be even glowing because he had an encounter with God. Be like Moses and his face will be shining. So praise God. Thank you. Have a wonderful week. And let's have a lot of great testimonies next week. Amen.
eu não acordei, eu só acordei quando tava barulhinho. Foi no sonho, eu, o Oi, oi. Um, dois. Um, dois. Um, dois, um, dois três. Aleluia. Testando. Um, dois. Ah. É só começar aqui. Eu já sinto e acordo. Não sei por quê. Eu sou nosso culto nessa manhã. É uma alegria poder. Mais uma vez o Senhor nos guardou, né? Nessa madrugada. É mais um motivo para adorar e louvar o nome do Senhor. Ele é fiel. Pai amado, Pai querido. Senhor, Tu és um Deus fiel e maravilhoso. O Senhor tem nos guardado, o Senhor tem nos abençoado, o Senhor tem Obrigado pela Tua fidelidade, obrigado pelo Teu amor. Obrigado, Pai, por esse dia que foi separado para a Sua adoração. Senhor, quero me te pedir, Senhor, que nessa manhã o Senhor possa abrir os nossos olhos. Senhor, o nosso coração, ó Pai, para que possamos ouvir e entender a Tua Palavra, que ela possa ser plantada nos nossos corações, Pai. Queremos alimentar o nosso Espírito, Senhor, nessa manhã. O Espírito Santo de Deus tem liberdade nesse lugar de agir, de mover, de transformar, de renovar. Move neste lugar, ó Pai, nessa manhã. Senhor, sobre as nossas vidas, Pai, enquanto nós te louvamos, Vamos louvar e adorar o nome do Senhor nessa manhã, amém? Com alegria? Amém. Aleluia! Eu 
Sua 